problem between us and others. Jacob gave his sons very wise advice. He told them exactly what to say. Please forgive, <coughs> forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin and treating you so cruelly. The term great wrong can also be translated evil. In the moment of confession, we may tend to downplay our sins or the sins of others. The behavior of Joseph's brothers toward him was nothing less than evil. Joseph knew firsthand the depth of their depravity. That was the burden his brothers were carrying all those years. I want to share with you a little bit about that. Joseph was uh, a man, he was the youngest, and uh, as the youngest, his brothers didn't like the fact that he was chosen by God to do something great, and they do it. They were nice to him. They, they treated him very roughly. In fact, they sold him and went back and told his dad that he had died. I thought they'd be more here. And later on, mm -hmm. I thought they'd be those more same here. people, Me too. those same well, brothers, ended up having to meet their youngest brother We're just to survive. Yeah. I've been a lot of things over the years, along with being a police officer for several years. I've also been a minister for equally as long. I've been a hospice chaplain and have ministered to people as young as an 18-year-old with two small kids. And I want to share with you that there are a lot of hurts. She was just sharing that there are some people, maybe even here, that have been hurt by others, possibly inside that building or the other building. But a lot of times we just have a lot of hurts in our lives. And so I want to relate to that. Throughout my life, I've had a good life. My wife calls it the leave it to beaver life. I grew up in a good home. I had good parents. They raised me right. I hope so. And uh, as, as uh, we went through life together, we've had people hurt us. A lot of people don't realize how hard it is to be a pastor's wife and a pastor. And there are a lot of hurts. Everybody's hurt is different, but I learned as a minister that whenever I talk to people and they tell me about a hurt in their life, if it really hurts them, you need to really pay attention to it. Because you may look at that hurt and think, wow, if they knew what a hurt really was, they wouldn't be worried about that hurt. But what happened is I realized that that hurt in their eyes was as big as some hurt that I would see in my eyes is very big. And so I learned that that hurt needed to be dealt with. And I want to let you know, no matter what the hurt is, I know sexual harassment is, is the point, but no matter what the hurt is in your life, I want you to know that God takes that very seriously. He knows and can feel the pain that you've been through. He's that kind of a God. He can take whatever problems that you have and help you through it through His Holy Spirit. And He wants to do that in your life today. Others are here today because you're mad. You're mad because of different things that have happened in these buildings to your friend, to your family member. But I also want you to know that you, you need to learn how to work with that person that's next to you. They might not need that madness it, that you're carrying with you, they may need you to be in a different type of mood to be able to help them through that difficulty that they're going on, that's going on in their life. They may need you to be that comforter through the Holy Spirit to be able to minister to them like no one else can. Because you see, as a minister coming in and helping someone who's going through a tragedy, they won't open up to me like they'll open up to a best friend or to a sister or a brother or a parent. And that's what you really need to do is reach out and help them through the difficulty that they are going through. Instead of just having an anger, it, it is important for us to be able to minister to that individual. But also, at the same time, there are others here who maybe you have a guilt in your mind of things that you have done to other people. The Bible says Jesus told the crowd, he who is without sin cast the first stone. 
and as he was writing on the ground and uh, doing just writing different things on the ground it doesn't say what he was writing but as he was writing on the ground he stopped and he looked up and the only one that was left was the girl the, the woman that they were accusing and he said uh, woman where is your accusers and they had all gone they dropped their rocks and walked away it's very important for us to also understand that if we have sin in our life we also have things that we need to deal with and that God is there for you as well. I want you to understand something. As a minister, everything I do, all that I am as a Christian even more is based on the Word of God. Everything that I say, everything that I base my life on is, is based in the Word of God. And maybe that's not who you are, but that's who I am. And the reason is because I realized that there were things in my life that I wasn't proud of. There's things that go on in my head that I don't want anybody to know about and probably the same way with you. You don't want those thoughts in there and Satan likes to throw them in there to distract you. I want you to know something. Whenever we forgive somebody, it is not to release them from the wrong that they did. I see the signs. I know what you're talking about. I've read in the paper, Vaughn has done a lot of standing up for us that we maybe were too scared to go into that room and, and talk to him about. But I also want you to understand that they will answer, or you will answer, whatever the sin is, they will answer for the wrong that they've done. But I also want you to understand that forgiveness is very important you still have to answer for the things that you've done, even if you seek and get forgiveness. But I want you to understand that the forgiveness that we ask for in our life is not to release them from the wrong that they did, it's to release us from having that burden and being in control of uh, letting that other person be in control of our thoughts and desires and everything about us. When someone does wrong to us, and I'm sure, especially uh, through sexual harassment, it eats us alive from the inside out. It controls us. It manipulates us. It makes people do really bad things at times. It, it makes people do cruel things and want to hurt other people. But the thing about forgiveness is when somebody has done you wrong and you go to them and you say, I'm sorry, or you say, I forgive you, what you have to understand is that doesn't release them from the wrong that they have done, but it releases you from the wrong that they have done to you. So it's you your mother. Pick it up. It's mommy. Being miserable because of how people treated me so bad. Because I know that I'd have a miserable life. A lot of people have done me wrong, and I would say that a lot of people have done everybody wrong in our life from time to time. But when we release them, it gives us permission to be happy again. And I hope you understand that. Because the ultimate thing about the Bible is that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us has done wrong according to God's standards. And, and as we hold ourselves to God's standards, nothing we can do will add up to being good enough to get into God's heaven. There have been many religions and individuals have worked really hard trying to reach that standard. But the ultimate forgiveness we need is from God himself. And if you've gone through life and you're miserable and you want that release, all you have to do is invite Christ into your life because Christ died on the cross. He shed his blood for us so that me, we might be able to live a happy life and not have to live in guilt of all of our sin and shame that we have. And I, I would like to let you know that after I'm finished, and we're going to say a prayer in just a minute, if you have reached a point where you're struggling with the things that people have done wrong to you, whether inside these buildings or whether it's uh, not related to this at all, and you'd like to have forgiveness with God, I would invite you to 
come up to me afterwards and I'd be happy to share what scripture says about that. It's so important for us to approach this in a right way. Whenever we want to bring attention to something, as we have with all of the different signs and media and all the different things that are going on, it's important that we approach it in a right and godly way, and that's what I hope we do today. If you need to invite Christ into your life, just come up to me afterwards, and I'd like to close with a word, word of prayer. Father God, we come before your throne, and we praise you and thank you that you're an almighty, all-powerful God. Lord, I take responsibility for anything wrong that I've messed up in the words that I've said, but I give you the glory for all the good that might come out of it. Father, I pray for each and every person that is here that have hurts in their life, that have, have experienced uh, uh, sexual harassment in any way, that have hurts that have brought them down and, and that they are in a state of misery. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will guide and direct them, that your holy comforter, the Holy Spirit, will reach out and do his great work as only he can. And Father, I pray for those who have done wrong to people, those you even say who have despitefully used us, that, Father, their conviction will be strong and mighty until they come to the place where they accept Christ and responsibility for their wrongs. Father, I want your will to be done in all that's going on. We thank you for Ivana and her leadership and the other people that are around her. Father, we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct all that they are doing. And Father, that your hand will be on elections, that the people who hold those offices will be people of whom you want to hold those offices. And Father, may we speak loudly by having everyone get out and vote in this great republic that we live in. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I am going to be popping up here and there holding up a different sign. This one is the Me Too sign because... Well, it's 2018 now, and I've been a grown-up for a while, and I've worked for a while, so of course I have a Me Too story. So I'm just going to go ahead and share one of them, because if you have worked for a while in a world full of um, men who think that they still have the right to humiliate and embarrass and degrade you at work because you're a girl, um, I might share another one. And if you have one that you want to share, Please, don't hesitate to come up. Okay. So, Lexington, Kentucky. I am working as a receptionist. I think I'm doing okay. And there's a guy who's been there for 20 years, knows what he's doing. He's one of those guys, he'll never be president of the company, but he knows so much that he'll never be fired. He's more valuable than I am. He comes up every day. He says, hi, I say, hi, I think I'm doing my job by being pleasant to him as well as everybody else. And for some reason, the very act of being nice to someone you work with turned into, oh, she must think I'm hot. That girl wants me. Ooh, yeah. So it went from, hi, Vaughn, how are you doing, to, hi, sweetie, you look great today. I really like what you're wearing. Um, to, hey, you know what? We should start getting lunch. Now, mind you, this is a man who was old enough to be my grandfather, and I did not know him outside work. So I was a little surprised that we went from, hey, Vaughn, hey, Jay, to, hey, baby, what's up? You know, it got a little ridiculous. And I said nothing. I didn't say anything to my boss because I thought sometimes people are weird. I came from a town with 68 people in it. I didn't really know that much about the world. I got chased around Union Station by a bunch of hobos at midnight, my first night away going to college. I just thought this was how the world worked. People said inappropriate things and you get chased by hobos. So it just kept going and going. And every day it was a little bit more over the line. And then the last thing was that he walked in, came behind my desk 
and started massaging me. And at that point, my 19-year-old brain said, this is not normal. This isn't what's supposed to happen at work. And so I asked a simple question, what are you doing? And he took his hands off me and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted that. And I said, what have I ever said in the history of all humankind to make you think that you need to invade my personal space and put your hands on me and start massaging my shoulders and heading down towards the tatas. And he said, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry. And he walked away and I never heard from him again. And see, this is the interesting thing about that. He knew he was wrong. He knew he was wrong from the moment he did it because he stopped right away and started using the back door of the building. And this was a man who was married with children. I didn't find that out until I, after I told a coworker what he'd done. So here's a man who sees someone who's young, doesn't know anything, thinks that he can get over. And I wish I could say that was the first time that happened to me in my life, in my work career, but it wasn't. People do things that they think they can get away with. People in this building behind us do what they think they can get away with. I'm a little bit cynical. I'm starting to think it's just human nature that you know we, we take what we can. We don't give it back until we're forced and we think that we're entitled to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that there is nobody, nobody who takes the public tax dollar for their job who's entitled to keep it. And that is the one thing that we should always remember. That is the one thing that they should always remember, but unfortunately they don't. So one of the reasons why we're here today is to remind them that that's not their job, that's our job. We have gifted them with this job. It is a privilege that they should respect and that they should treat us with respect and intelligence. And don't feel None of you should feel in any way that you have to put up with someone's nonsense, not at work. You don't have to do that. So that is my Me Too story. That is one of the reasons why I'm out here. And one of the things that we'll be doing throughout the day is we'll be asking people from the audience if they will come up and read a quote to inspire the folks who aren't here today, because this is being live streamed on Facebook. It's going to the Missouri St. Francis St. Francis County Missouri Politics page which has in less than a month and a half over 2000 members including members of the media, including government agencies, including people who work in this building who like to say we won't answer questions from St. Francis County Missouri Politics page because those people are just a bunch of whiners. But they're reading them. So this is for all of those folks. And I'm going to call Carmen Denton up here to read something out that she picked out that spoke to her. So Miss Denton, Carmen Denton, people. Thank you, Miss Vaughn. My name's Carmen. I'm married to Greg Denton. This speaks to me, it's all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The reason it resonates is because I, a job I worked at in this county. I worked there, I thought I was doing really well. I was climbing the ladder, so I thought. Now I'm no beauty queen, y'all, but everybody was allowed to invite their spouses or their significant other to an after work little celebration. My boss came to me and told me, I'm not comfortable with your husband coming. Y'all guess what? My husband came. I was fired shortly thereafter because he was, he was very uncomfortable being around my husband. Well, I'm proud of that man. He's proud of me and he has a real hard time shutting my mouth. But he still loves me. <laughs> I put up with nothing. Maybe that makes me bad. Maybe that makes me a loud mouth. But I'm a woman, I'm proud of who I am. Thank you, Carmen. I'll be circulating 
and I might have my wonderful husband circulating through the audience, giving other people an opportunity to come up and say something. Um, my husband is over there in the white and green Hawaiian shirt. And I just want to share this story for people who don't know. That is Kevin Carricker. Um, I own a house in Farmington. I've owned it for about 12 years. I just now decided to let go of it because I felt that after being married to him for almost 10 years, it was going to work out, so I didn't need a backup plan. But he really solidified that when I was attacked in the paper by the county auditor who apparently does not feel that I, as a taxpayer and a resident of this county, has a right. I have a right to come in and ask for records because it's hard to dig them up. And my husband wrote the most beautiful, the most eloquent, the most wonderful letter defending me and in my mind defending every taxpayer and pointing out the obvious to our government officials who probably didn't realize it until he wrote it. And he hand delivered that letter to Mr. Cyberlick, our auditor, and then he posted it on Facebook. And I thought, that is the manliest thing the manliest thing. I have the best husband in the entire world. And if you haven't yet joined it, go to the St. Francis County, Missouri politics page and join that group. Because rule number one of that group is don't be rude. This is a place where people can discuss politics without calling each other names, without cursing. It's simply one opinion after another. And people who disagree with opinions are allowed to post and discuss. There's so much discussion on that page. In so little time, it's grown from, what, 60 people to over 2,000 in less than six weeks. People who say they're not on that page are on that page. Join that page. Join the discussion. Find out what's going on in this county. So I'm going to move on, and I'm going to introduce Ramona Gow who, like me, is a woman and an attorney who probably has her own stories, who is here today to talk to you about corruption. So, ladies and gentlemen, Ramona Gow. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has joined us here this morning. It's Saturday morning. None of you had to be here, but you found it important enough to come out here and join us. And I just right now want everybody to give yourself a round of applause for showing up and speaking out. So as Vaughn said, I'm here to talk about corruption. And a basic question is, what is corruption? We all know it when we see it. You see something going on, it, it gets your blood flowing, gets you upset, gets you thinking. But what really is it? So. As a lawyer, I like to read and research, and actually I went to the dictionary and I read the definition of corruption. And as simple and basic as I can put it out there, corruption is dishonesty in a position of power. Two things, we have dishonesty and we have somebody in power. And that can be across any, any facet of government, in the private workplace, anywhere where somebody is in a position of power, where they're using that to either be dishonest for actions or getting money. It could be all across that. <laughs> Sorry. So with corruption, the next question that I had was, well, what do we do about it? We see it. We know it exists. There's greed in this world, and there's, there's corruption. I went back to the Facebook feeds when all of this started. And I say all of this started, and when I say that, I mean people speaking out, speaking up, and joining each other. And that took me back to Officer Ryan Miller's post on Facebook. And in his post, what he did is he stood up and he spoke out and he spoke the truth. And when you're dealing with corruption and you're dealing with somebody who is in a position of power who is being dishonest and taking advantage of people, the best way to out corruption is to shine light on it and speak out against it. And that took me back to a story that I learned when I was a kid, which was 
When you're dealing with darkness, when you're dealing with dishonesty, when you're dealing with hidden secrets, my parents always called that darkness. And if you have a dark room and you just shine one little light in that room, do we have darkness anymore? We don't. Because darkness cannot exist where there is light. And I wanted to call my speech today this little light of mine. And then it was mentioned to me that, well, somebody might think you're going to get up there and sing, and God, we don't need that. <laughs> I'm not, not the singer here. But really, it comes down to that song that I know all of us learned when we were in preschool in vacation Bible school, in church, or even just at school, which is, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But what's the true meaning of that song? What's the purpose of that song? When you have your truth, when you know what's right, you got to let it shine. You can't hide it. Nobody's going to cover it up. And when you're able to stand up and speak out, just like Officer Miller did, and just like all of the brave individuals that have been victims of this county and of public officials in this county, as all of those folks have spoken up, they've turned their light on. And we start with one little light in that darkness. And as each light comes on after that, we start seeing more and more and more. I expect if I asked anyone here, do you want the county that you're living in? Do you want the county that you're raising your families in, or that you have raised your families in, to be a county known for corruption? I expect every single one of you would say no. I take pride in where I'm at. I chose to be here, and there's things that I like and love about this area. But ultimately, we have to stand up and we have to expose it to get it out. We get it out, we move on, and we make this a better place. So I really want everyone here, it's really easy to talk to each other and get upset and get mad. And sometimes it feels good to just know that somebody else is just as upset as you are. But I really want to encourage everyone to take that next step. Let's not stop at being frustrated, but let's ask, where can I help? What can I do? And maybe all you can do because of where you're at and what's going on is show up. Talk to your neighbor. See what's going on with them. Make sure they know what's going on. Or maybe you're in a situation where you have a personal story that needs to be shared. And I know that standing up and outing corruption cannot be easy. I've been in uh, my own situations. I'm an attorney. I once had to testify against a judge. Was that comfortable? Absolutely not. Did I want to do it? Absolutely not. Did I? You better, I, I'll watch my language there. <laughs> You're right, I did. I absolutely did. Because at the end of the day, you never go wrong doing the right thing. And so that's where I really hope that everybody can take this idea of, we know corruption's happening, now what is my part? What is my role? What can I do? And I know, first of all, I thanked everybody here for showing up this morning, but I also want to thank each and every one of you here who has taken that next extra step, who has been vulnerable, and who has shared things that we're not comfortable to share about what's happening. Those folks who are flipping on their lights to expose what is happening. I want everyone here to give another round of applause to those folks who have been brave enough and have had the support to be able to stand up and speak out about their individual stories. As I said, I'm not going to sing. I'm not, I'm not going to sing this little light of mine. But I really hope that that song you carry with you after this rally today. And ultimately, folks, it really comes down to there's a time when silence becomes dangerous. 
and when silence becomes betrayal. And right now, right now in St. Francis County, that time has come. And I just want to encourage all of you to continue on, support each other, and know that this is not to tear anything down. It's to get the darkness out, bring the light in, and keep this county moving forward in the direction that every one of you wants it to head. Thank you. Hi. I think at this point we're going to call up Miss Cindy Johnson. And she is one of those people who's been really active in helping get the word out about the things that have been going on in this county. And she found in the pile of inspiration, that's what I'm going to call it, the pile of inspiration, she found something that rang to her, that rang true to her, and she's going to come up and read it. Cindy Johnson. Wait a minute. Where did that tiny red-haired woman go? <sighs> okay. Anyway, until we find Cindy... I'm going to talk about a story of triumph. There was a woman, and I believe her name was Jeanette Mignon, who worked as a corrections officer in a prison here in Missouri. And she was, like most people who come to work, doing her job, focused on minding her business and doing the best job that she could. And there was a coworker who thought she was cute and decided that he would bug her every day and tell her all about it, as if she didn't already know, you know? But he thought that it would be special if it came from him because he was about to do stuff he shouldn't have been doing. And the things that he started doing, besides publicly commenting about her appearance, and she was a security, was a guard at the prison, appearance, as you know, is not the number one thing they look for for prison guards. It shouldn't have mattered. One of the things that they did, that this person did to her, was try to go into the bathroom every time she went to the toilet. Yeah, that is freaky. He would wait, we all, come on. We know that's freaky. What are you doing? When you go to the bathroom, do you want company? Do you call people and invite them over? Do you, is anybody here? We all know that's nasty. Okay. So dude was nasty. Every time she went into the bathroom, he would try to open the door. Sometimes he was successful. One time he pushed it open and she tried to shove it back and she ended up urinating on her own clothing because her coworker thought this was tremendously funny. And she put up with it for a long time. And then she started to complain. And because she complained, she was transferred out of a unit that she worked in and had been doing very well at. And when she was transferred out instead of the person who was harassing her, and, and let me make a point, not only was he harassing her, but he was harassing her openly in front of their co-workers who all thought it was funny, the ones who would speak up, and then the ones who didn't speak up but who thought it was hideous, okay? So this wasn't a secret. It wasn't just her word versus his. There were plenty of witnesses. She was the one who was transferred out. And then she started getting bad performance reviews. They started coming all at once, where she had never gotten a bad performance review in her entire career. All of a sudden, she's getting bad review after bad review. There were five in all, and one of them was because she skipped at work. She got written up for skipping at work. You know, this stuff wasn't going to get any better. And then in the end, she got an attorney. She filed a suit. She won. And I want to tell you, this is a case that I pulled up from 2018. So it had been going on for a couple of years, and it got resolved this year. This woman won $100,000 in actual damages and $1 million in punitive damages. Can I get an amen on that? Okay. So the interesting thing about that case is that it was her testimony about how she felt. She testified that she felt so degraded by what was happening to her. Ladies and gentlemen, that's damage. 
And the court said, you know what? You don't have to have a bunch of medical bills to show that you had suffered some sort of physical or emotional harm. You don't need to show that you lost wages. You don't need to show that stuff. You just need to prove that these things were happening and that they retaliated against her. Interestingly enough, they did not agree that she had been sexually harassed because sexual harassment is hard to prove in some cases. But the reason why they didn't agree is because of a technical reason. So it had nothing to do with the facts of the case. However, they did agree that workplace retaliation is an actual thing, and if it happened, you're going to be punished for it. So I'm here to tell you in 2018, I was able to go over to my office for five minutes, pull that case out, and read and know without a shadow of a doubt that this state, the courts, in this state, the courts care about victims. They care about victims' rights. They care about people being retaliated at work for doing the right thing. And that is why I am so stoked about today. I'm going to move on and I'm going to introduce Jason Tilly. Jason is not only a dude with words to share with us today, he is a dude with a child. He's a dude with a daughter and a son. And we thought that it would be important to talk about these things from the perspective of not just the victims, but the people who have to watch helpless when they're going through these things. So Mr. Tilly is going to give us a talk from a perspective of a father. Jason Tilly. Thank you, Vaughn. First of all, let me say that it's an honor to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I got this invite at about 5 o'clock yesterday, and the first thought that came to my mind was how important it was to make sure that my daughter Caroline was here. And that's her standing right there in the real pretty dress. Um, and it was important for her to be here because I think this is an important moment for this community because big changes always begin small. In, 19, in 1848, the first women's conference was held in Seneca Falls, New York. And just a, a hundred people, 68 women and 32 men, signed a declaration of sentiments that outlined a list of grievances. And that was the start of what became a national movement that culminated in 1920 with the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. Now, that wasn't the end of the struggle, okay? It was a milestone in the struggle. And we are here today for another milestone in that greater struggle. And this milestone is something that has been ignored too long, has been uncomfortable to talk about too long, has been taboo too long, and has been accepted too long. And that is the harassment, the objectification, and the abuse of women, not just at work, but in society as a whole. And while there has been some progress made nationally, we, both men and women, because I'm looking out and I'm seeing almost as many men here today as women. And that, to me, is an incredibly inspiring sight. But we have come here today together to say no more. No more will our friends, neighbors, and loved ones have to feel like they accept being harassed at their jobs and in their daily lives. No more will our friends, neighbors, and loved ones feel like they are at risk of losing their jobs for speaking up about harassment. And no more will this community tolerate the objectification, harassment, and abuse of our friends, neighbors, and loved ones who depend on their jobs to support their families. Now, I have personally witnessed harassment at work. I've seen its effects, and they're devastating. But almost as disturbing as the effects, I've seen a system that does more to protect the abuser than the victim. I've seen a system that does more to protect the abuser than the individuals who are reporting the, abu the abuse. And I've seen a system that allows public retribution by the abuser without consequence. This is unacceptable and it's not going to be tolerated anymore. And as I thought last night about what I was going to say here today, it became more and more clear how important it was for Caroline to be here and to understand that she does not 
and will not have to grow up in a world where she has to fear losing her job or not getting a promotion because she refuses the sexual advances of her boss. But it's even bigger than that because I want her to grow up in a world where she doesn't have to be afraid of that type of objectification, harassment, and abuse anywhere, be it in her workplace or being out to dinner with her friends. So it is so very important for all of us to do our parts to give that sense of safety and security to all of our daughters. Now I thank each and every one of you for being here today. It's a courageous first step to recognize that there's a problem and to take the time out from your weekend to be here. But this is the easy part. It's easy because from today going forward, the most important thing is to no longer say, it is no longer what we have to say about this problem, but what we do to change it. I challenge each and every one of you to go forward today and dedicate yourself not only today, but in the future, to be a part of the solution. And how do we be a part of that solution? I was sitting at home preparing my remarks last night, and it was like a light bulb went off in my head. It isn't enough for us to prepare our daughters to deal with this problem. It isn't enough for us to do that and hope and pray that we leave a better world for our daughters. The true solution to this problem is why I also brought my nine-year-old son, Colin. It's not enough to prepare our daughters to, be, to deal with being objectified, harassed, and abused. It's not enough to hope and pray that they don't have to deal with that. We must be proactive to protect our daughters. The way, the, the way we do that is so very simple. We teach our sons to be better. That's why Colin is here today. I do not believe that this type of behavior is genetic. I believe that with love and patience, we can teach all of our sons the difference between right and wrong. So for my part, I'm starting in my home. I want my son to understand, even at nine years old, that women are to be respected that women are to be admired, and that under no circumstances are women to be ever viewed as objects. I am asking you to leave here today resolved to do, not say, but to do your part to change our small corner of the world. Mother Teresa once said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. The greatest way to love our daughters is to raise them to be strong, independent women. And the greatest way to love our sons is to teach them to respect our daughters, to teach them to cherish our daughters, and to teach them to be good men. Mr. Tilly, you killed it. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so you. much. Okay, I was on the hunt for a redhead, and she probably is, uh, there she is. Doggone it, Cindy. I was going to send out some sort of APB. So, as I said before, Cindy Johnson has been instrumental in helping get the word out in St. Francis County. And actually, because of what... Um, Cindy and people like Jesse James here who's in front of me live streaming this to Facebook. Um, what people like Cindy and Jesse and Betty Warner who's also here. Betty, put a hand up so that people can see you. Okay. These folks have done so much to alert the county to what's going on to make it possible for us to live stream this to over 2,000 people and making it possible for people in other counties to be inspired by what they have started. And I would be remiss, doggone it, that's my trash, I'll take care of it. I would be remiss in not recognizing 
the real heroes in this whole battle, the people you've read about in the Riverfront Times, Lisa Davidson, who had the courage to step up and speak up, Stephanie Williams, who tried this fight by herself four years ago and came back in, you know, and like I say, keep throwing punches until they're down. And Stephanie is one of those people who epitomizes that phrase. Brett Burgess, who spoke up. Jan Petty. And all of the people who are still terrified to talk, but who have reached out, who've called me, who've Facebook messaged me, who've texted me, who've reached out to the, me through their friends. This is for you. We support you. We believe you. More importantly, the state auditor believes you, and the state attorney general believes you, because they have opened investigations into the allegations that we've been making. So, Cindy Johnson, come on up here and give us some more inspiration. Okay, I don't know about inspiration, but um, I, I became interested in this when people started talking about um, things that were happening here. And I was born and raised here and moved away after I got married and then came back um, 20 years ago. And, and I'm invested here. This is where um, my grandkids are, and that's what I think about um, is what kind of future we're going to leave them. And so I'm really concerned with the things that, um, that have been revealed and the things that I witnessed myself um, when I first went to that um, meeting, um, the commissioner's meeting, I was shocked about the attitude and everything. And let me tell you, I'm probably older than most of you here. And so I remember in the 70s when I started working, um, what I had to go through, and it was like that in there. It was that kind of attitude. And so when I, and I've worked up the ranks, and you know, we, we got a lot of that behind us, I thought. Um, and then when I sat there that first time that I went to the meeting and, and saw the attitude that prevailed and the disrespect that was shown, I thought there's absolutely no excuse for that. And it just actually raised the hairs on my, my um, arms because I thought, no way, this is, it can't be like this again. But it is, and here we are, and that's okay because just like I did back in the 70s, we're going to fight it and we're going to overcome. Um, and so I, I personally really appreciate so many people's efforts, um, so many people have messaged out to me, and, um, and I don't know why, because we don't know each other, but, um, but I'm a good listener, and then I relate information to other people, and it's so important that you start out, and I know, like Vaughn just said, a lot of people are still terrified to speak, and I hate that, because I remember what that was like. I remember having to sit there and suffer through the day doing a good job, um, but not getting any recognition and being disrespected and not being paid as much and so on and so forth. And it's just amazing to me that we're still going through this. So this might be a small effort right now, but it's going to swell. I encourage everyone to talk to their friends, to talk about it. I encourage those who still have a fear to come out. I really encourage you to know that we will stand behind you and we're not going to let anything happen to you. And it just takes right. It just takes one or two of you to speak up to give others the courage. And so any of you who know someone who knows something, now's the time, since we've got the attention of the state, um, to look at this. Now's the time. And one thing will lead to another because I promise you, people who abuse their power um, get to the point where they feel um, confident that they can continue to do that and, and nothing's there aren't going to be any repercussions but i think we're going to show them differently now's the time they're not going to be able to get away with it anymore so just know that there are a lot of people behind you encourage your friends anyone who knows anything so i think it's great that people are out here today i think it's great that people care you know we're a small community and we may have grown from what we were when i grew up but um you know, we've still got a lot of people here who care about one another, a lot of families, and it's just not right that we have to look at our, our friends and our neighbors and know that they should have good jobs down here, they should be getting paid what they need to be paid, and they should be able to work throughout the day and not have to have any harassment or any fear of what they might do, not only might cost them their jobs, but send them to jail. And, and that's, so some of you who know me know that I, I work on prison reform and I look, work with a lot of felons and I work with um, 
uh, addiction in our community, and that affects all of us. And so these people who are, are feel like they might be sent to jail just for speaking the truth, that's ridiculous, and we need to stop that. So um, Vaughn gave me, um, told me to pick a quote, and that's what I'm going to share with you because um, this just spoke to me. Um, and it's by Ashley Marie Egan. Sorry, I don't know who that is, but I like her quote. It says, they ask us why we waited so long to raise our voices and sing our songs. They don't understand the paralyzing fear and sickening shame abusers make you feel. Do not listen to those who would re-victimize your pain. Turn away from hate. For now we rise, together we stand, we shed ourselves of our victim skin, we are survivors. And in the end, we're all going to be survivors and we're going to be able to put this behind us. So thank you for coming out. Thank you very much, Cindy. I think a lot of us have enjoyed reading some of Cindy's quotes and comments on Facebook. Next, I want to read a quote which is from Theodore Roosevelt, and it's called The Man in the Arena. And this is talking about the person who is in the arena, who is in the fight, the people who are literally in the throes of what is going on. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error or shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end triumph of achievement, and who at worst knows at least he fails, he fails while daring greatly. And that quote goes on, but I hope that as you hear that, you're inspired, if you're not yet in the arena, to step into that arena. So. In talking about what are we going to do here at this rally, I think one thing that happens at rallies is there's also chants that go on. And if anybody here has any clever chants, I would absolutely welcome them. But I want to share with you and ask you to join along one that I actually came up with. And it goes like this. When bullies attack, stand up, fight back. When bullies attack, stand yep. up, fight back. Join with me. When bullies attack, stand up, fight back. When bullies attack, stand up, fight back. When bullies attack, stand up, fight back. I hope that gives power and that gives confidence to you. Now, it's starting to get a little warm out here. I want everybody to know there's a big cooler over here with a lot of ice and a lot of water. Come help yourself. We also have some water over here, too. We are going to take a brief break. Please talk to each other, mingle. We'll be back up here in about five minutes to keep this thing going. And also, those of you who want to share your stories or want to stand up, please come up. Let's chat. The microphone is an open mic. We want the community to share. Thank you, everyone. Let's take a five minute break. We did bring water, and I understand there will be hot dogs later, but let's take a moment.
here for three solid hours it is getting a little warm and i am out of fans so i got two more and it's about to go hunger games on those two so strongest wins the fan but we do have a couple more things we want to do before we get out of here i want to invite karen adams up here karen has been instrumental in this community and um helping to put in systems and processes to help people with mental health issues to deal with some of the things that have been going on. Ms. Adams is going to want to say some words directly to some of these victims. So Karen Adams, people, let's give her a great welcome. Thank you all very much. Uh, yeah, Vaughn asked me, uh, she was coming over there and asking me if I would read a quote uh, from someone. I said, uh, I would rather just say something directly <laughs> rather than re reading somebody else's uh, words because I have a very strong feeling about what happens to people when they've been violated. 
I my my entire political career or uh, work career was in in out, out of politics and in mental health. So I don't have any idea about all the politics and all the legalities of what's happening. But I know what happens to people when they've been abused, misused, and coerced, and all other kind of things. And I'm speaking not only to the women, but there's men standing here, and that happens to men too. I was a C CEO for the Department of Health. And, and in my younger years, I saw men being abused by women as well, sexual harassed and things like that. So I'm speaking to both men and women. If you have directly been affected by this, please find someone that you can talk to about what happened and what it made you feel like, because that is the beginning of your healing. Don't hesitate to do that. Find someone you can trust, go to them, and that may be a professional, it may be a really good friend, it may be somebody that you just have trust and confidence in their ability to, to hear you and let you speak. But please do that, because otherwise, you carry this kind of wound with you for the rest of your life and you never get past it. So please do that. This past week, I was listening to a pastor on the radio, Rick Warren. Many of you probably hear him, listen to him. And he had a very succinct statement to say. He said, revealing the feeling begins the healing. And folks, I encourage you to please do that. I've left some material with Vaughn if you need to call or, or look on the internet or something like that to look for help. And if not, you you tell her not. She can get a hold of me. She has my number. And I will help you find somebody that can help you do that. But please do it because most important for you is to recover your your health in every respect. So please do that. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. And in that same vein, I do want to um, ask you all to give a big thanks to the people who organized this. They're over here in the red tent. I call them the red tent people because they wanted to stay under the radar. <laughs> Which probably would lead some of you to ask what's going on over here in the gray tent. At the blue table are probably all the papers you would ever need that would help you, your friend, your neighbor, your daughters, your sons, your parents, your cousins, to address workplace harassment, sexual harassment, misconduct by an attorney. We've got over there uh, information sheets that explain harassment. We've got sheets that explain retaliation. We've got the complaint forms that you would fill out to file a complaint with the Public Corruption Unit, which is the federal government, with the Attorney General's Office, with the Auditor's Office, with the Office of the Chief Disciplinary Counsel. People ask me all the time, this person did something scummy. If he sexually harassed me, shouldn't he be arrested? And I explain to them, there is a difference. There is a difference between what is illegal, what is unethical, and what is just immoral. You can do something immoral. You can be, I'm, I'm just using as an example, you can be unfaithful in your marriage and be a public official. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've committed an act of corruption. It doesn't mean that you've broken the law. Certainly doesn't. You could, however, be unfaithful in your marriage and reward a person you're unfaithful with with public funds and that crosses the border, I think, into being a crime. And I think that when we look at these forms, the AG's office, the Attorney General's office, is looking for crime. What is this public official doing that would be illegal if it were being done, um, if it violated the statute, it would be illegal. The Attorney General's office has the power to remove elected officials from office for committing crimes. And here's an interesting thing that I learned in my research, because I do a lot of research, I love research. The interesting thing that I learned in my research is that you don't actually have to mean to commit that crime. You just had to have done it. Even if you committed a crime and then discovered later on that you were committing this crime and you went back and fixed it, the Attorney General can still remove you. 
there was a case in another county not too far from here where the mayor appointed the fire chief as and the fire chief happened to be a relative of his i think it was his brother and he didn't know that he wasn't supposed to do that and as soon as he found out he unappointed him but the law was broken he committed misconduct in office he did something he shouldn't have done and unfortunately for him even though he tried to do the right thing he was removed from office because it's very strict like that so it doesn't it, it, and you know that law about allowing the state to remove people from office it applies to things that they do it also applies to things that they should have done but didn't so there's a lot of room in there for them to work if they receive complaints i'm going to talk right now about some of the stories that I have heard. Now, I want to say this because I think this is important. I do not practice criminal law. <laughs> when I started looking into this, I did not have a dog in this fight. I didn't have a client who would be affected by it. I didn't know these people. I didn't know what was going on. I barely read the paper, or I used to barely read the paper. I've been figuring since, hey, they're talking, let's read it. But um, what I'm saying to you is, I was minding my own business, sitting at my desk, just being me, and I got something in a text that said, hey, are you looking at what's going on here? And I read some outrageous story about a woman who'd been railroaded into jail because of a sexual relationship that was alleged between some court employees and a prosecutor, and they hated her, and this all went south real fast. And I thought, that is the most outrageous thing I have ever heard in my life. Who does that? This isn't the WB. And I expect, you know, two or three 20-something-year-olds who look like teenagers to come in and emote for 30 minutes over this. It just sounded like a TV story. And then I called a friend and said, hey, did you see this nonsense? And then that friend apparently called someone else and I got a phone call from a woman who came to my office with paper. And it wasn't about this outrageous story that I just heard. Time will tell if that story can be proven. Time will tell. So I'm not gonna judge one way or another. But this person brought in paper, and I love paper. You see me with paper all the time. And in this paper were threads of an idea, threads of a story that I thought, wow, that's wild. But I can't prove or disprove what's on these papers. It was allegations of financial misconduct by a public official in this county. And I'm not gonna name him, but that public official is Jared Mahirin. So, I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Let me go look, because you got to either disprove it or prove it. So we went here to this building, this beautiful building behind you that I remind you is paid for by your money and my money, and they should never forget it. in this building are records that will either prove or disprove this outrageousness that I was looking at. And as some of you know, I had kind of a hard time getting this information. And really, this is where I should pop up again with the Me Too sign, because I have been bullied like you would not believe if you haven't seen the videos on YouTube. I have been shut up, shut down, shouted at, threatened with deputies, just for asking questions about taxpayer dollars. Who calls the law because you want to know what was done with this money? Who does that? Come on. And so, what are they you, hiding? You, know, you know what happens when you ask questions that really should have a simple answer and people act like you just joined some movie where Will Smith is running from some shadow organization and stuff is blowing up all the time, you know? <laughs> it just made me more curious. And in today's political climate, curiosity makes you a victim. I've been victimized for being curious about what goes on in this building. And I thought that was kind of crazy because I grew up, I'm gonna read my favorite quote 
of all time. And this is from Harry Truman. And you gotta love Harry Truman, okay? If you don't love Harry Truman, don't even talk to me about it. You're gonna break my heart and hurt my feelings. It's the only thing that would hurt my feelings right now, actually. Okay. So Harry Truman wrote, or he probably said this out loud a bunch of times too, every one of you has a hand in this government. And when you don't exercise that great privilege, which our forefathers sought to give you, you are shirking your duty. And then if the government goes wrong, there's nobody to blame but you. He didn't say it like that. I don't think he does that like that. I'm sure he did it in the manliest fashion. I think after Teddy Roosevelt, I think Harry Truman would be our manliest president in the traditional sense, the literary sense. He didn't ride a buffalo or a moose across a river, but you know, the man spoke truth. And he wasn't afraid to speak truth. He said, the buck stops here. I wish these guys would say that, but they're not. All of the bullying that I have been on the receiving end of has been followed by exactly one apology. And that was right out here where the bullying didn't happen. See, there's this thing I have found in my career as a woman, and I'm going to tell you a secret. I am actually black. <laughs> and sometimes that plays into it. I wish it didn't, but sometimes it does. I have found that there is this sense of entitlement entitlement to the job. I hold this office, I'm entitled to keep it. I hold this office, you don't have the right to question me about what I do when I'm in it. I hold this office and I can do whatever I want. And that's what's going on here in my opinion. So when I go up there and I'm told, okay, Vaughn, you can speak now. And then I get nine words in and they get to, they get to the shutting me down part the talking over me, the talking around me, the talking about me, the getting exasperated. I don't walk into a room where people do this all the time, <sighs> unless it's my own family, you know? When they make you feel like you are inconveniencing them for asking what you have a statutory right and a constitutional right to know, Something is wrong, people. Something is very, very, very wrong. You should be able to walk into that building with a sunshine law request and have people say, oh, excellent, thank you. I appreciate you giving that to me. Yes. We'll get these records. We'll let, we'll let you know in three days how long it's going to take, what's going to cost. Oh, it's for the public interest? Okay, well, we'll consider whether or not we should charge you for that. That should be the conversation. Yes. It shouldn't be, Vaughn needs to be quieted. These taxpayers need to be quieted. It's all political. This word political has become a dirty word. I heard yesterday on the radio, Chris Ward, who I believe is running for assessor in this Dan, county, Dan. on the radio saying that this is all political, that rally, he was talking about cell phone monitoring. And he said, speaking of cell phone monitoring, this rally tomorrow, is political. There's no corruption. I've been up there. I've been at those meetings. There's no corruption. And, you know, it's all political. They're just trying to get people. And I had two thoughts about that. One was, who the heck are you? That was my first thought because I don't remember seeing him at any of the meetings I attended. Maybe I just don't recognize him. I don't know. And my second thought was, from listening to the county, I'm the only person requesting records. If Chris Ward is out there, you know, requesting records, why aren't they complaining about him? Dan. Dan Ward. Dan Ward. Is it Dan? Yes. I apologize. It was Dan Ward. So, sorry, Chris. It's Dan. Can I just call him new Chris? Okay. So, Dan Ward's out there trashing corruption um, protest rallies, and specifically this one, because he's been to some meetings and he doesn't see any corruption at the meetings. Well, golly, Dan, if corruption was so easy to see, you could drive by this building and it would be flashing across these windows. There's corruption today, like a weather report. I mean, I am no expert in corruption, but I think that part of the point of it is that it's not so easy to find. So, I 
as you probably know, some of you know, have made request after request after request after request, just trying to get at the truth, just trying to say, okay, either I think this happened or I think this didn't happen, as is my right. And I got stymied and bullied and attacked publicly by people I've never even met, never even heard of, and attacked publicly by our public officials because apparently I committed the crime of curiosity. I knew it killed the cat, but I didn't think it destroyed reputations. But hey, I'm a tough chick. Keep going, Mom. Keep going. Keep going. Now, I'm not as tough as Lisa Davidson. I'm not as tough as Stephanie Williams. I am not. I never reported any time anything happened to me. The one time I did speak up was out of complete shock, but the other times I just let it happen. So I applaud these women again for their courage, for their absolute strength of will, and for overcoming what I knew was a terrible fear of retaliation. Because it is hard out here for someone who's searching for the truth and wants to speak truth to power. We have all, if you've listened to the radio, heard the threats last week. The prosecutor threatening to come after me and the whistleblowers for the crime of speaking up, which is allowed by statute, and saying, I think there's something wrong here. I'm going to tell you another truth. You don't have to be right about your allegation. If you think something is wrong, the law allows you to speak up without fear of retaliation. And if it's disproven, fine. But it's out there. It's not festering in the back like some pus-filled wound. It is out in the open. You get that in the light. You clean it out. You deal with it. And maybe you reveal some information that you didn't know before. In the course of looking into this, I found out that they changed the workplace retaliation laws. Who knew that the law changed in 2018? Show of hands if you knew that the workplace retaliation laws changed in 2018. One dude, Kevin? Okay. So here's what I found out. If you suspect that something is going on in your office, and I'm talking about government officials here because this law was in place for private citizens last year, last June, not this June of this year, but last June of 2017, private citizens could report abuse, misconduct, wrongdoing, whatever, and not be worried about losing their jobs. They forgot about government officials, public employees, like the people in this building. As of April, if you work for the government in any capacity, whether it's big government or small government, if you suspect something's not right, you get to speak up. And it's not like the old days where you have to go bring it to your supervisor and everybody knows about your supervisor and you know it's going nowhere. It's not like the old days. You can now bring it to your supervisor. You can bring it to your supervisor's supervisor, which was the other fallback plan that nobody really loved. You can take it to the police. You can tell your prosecutor. You can also tell the public. You can put it on social media. You can talk to a reporter. You can tell your family at the cookout. You can tell anybody as long as you speak up and go public, as long as you tell somebody what is going on. They cannot fire you because that violates the law. And that is something that these people in this building, I guarantee you, are not telling the folks who work here. And this is something that I want all of you to go out and tell your cousins, your friends, your brothers, everybody who works in public government, let them know that this law has existed since April and they have no reason to be afraid anymore. Now before I leave here, before I um, end this particular chat, I'm gonna talk about some of the stories that I've been hearing because I started this back in February and it was about May that I sat down and looked at what I had and I realized that I believed these people, okay? And because I believed these people, I filed a complaint with the state attorney general and I filed a complaint with the public corruption office because that's what you're supposed to do. We are not strangers here, we're neighbors. This is our county. 
and we are supposed to help each other. And I could not, after learning all of this stuff, go back to my office and pretend that I didn't know anything. I didn't want to take the coward's way out because that's not who I try to be. I like to wake up every morning and try to be the person I think I am. And I think most people are like that. But I can tell you that I've heard enough stories about retaliation in this county to believe and to respect why people have been silent for so long. For so long. I've heard several stories about people who have said something to cross the prosecutor and that prosecutor has called their bosses to try to get them fired. Why would you do that? What is so insecure about words that make you want to destroy someone's career because you don't like what comes out of their mouth? I've heard several stories of that. I didn't believe them then, I believe them now. Because I too am a victim of threats of retaliation. And as my husband said, bring it. Why wait? So. I've heard stories of women who have been followed into the ladies room by public officials attempting to convince them to have sex with them. I have heard stories of women who have been cornered in the basement of the courthouse by public official who tried to convince them to have sex with them. I have heard stories of women trading sex for plea bargains. I've heard stories of pictures of crime victims, naked pictures of crime victims being shared in bars by prosecutors. I've heard stories of strip clubs being paid for with public money. I've heard stories of drinking parties, all kinds of debauchery and excess that may have been funded on the public dime. Now, are all these stories true? I don't know, time will tell. But what I am hearing and what I've been able to determine and, and confirm so far leads me to believe that there is a lot that's rotten here in St. Francis County. And we, not just the people in this parking lot, but the people who are watching this on Facebook and wherever it's being live streamed, I have heard enough to convince me that we need to let these men and these women know that you can now speak up. The Attorney General is listening. They're looking into it. This is the time to come forward and confirm what you've told me to these people who are investigating. This is the time for you to come forward and say, yes, this happened to me. This is the time for you to bring forward your texts, bring your text messages, bring your pictures, bring your audio, bring your story. If you don't have the audio, the text, or the pictures, come anyway, because you are an eyewitness to your own victimization. It's time to speak up. I'm only one person. Lisa Davidson is only one person. Stephanie Williams is only one person. Brett Burgess is only one person. Jan Petty, only one person. And together that makes five, and I know how to do five, you know? But I know that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of victims in this county. And it can't always just be us five. So I am encouraging you now. The time is ripe. It will never be better. Speak up. Come forward. I think it just got super, super hot here. <laughs> and I think that we've done enough today. I think it's time to wrap this up. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank everybody who stepped up. I want to thank all of you who made signs, and I want to thank you for your continued support of these victims, and I want to encourage you to speak to them and tell them to come talk to me. And if not me, grab a sheet of paper off that desk of the person they do want to talk to. It's not too late. The time is perfect. It's time to speak up and get this county back from the people who've damaged it so badly. Thank you. to thank Vaughn for her curiosity. Here's the curiosity. When bullies attack, stand up, fight back. When bullies attack, stand up, fight back. When bullies attack, we're standing up right now and we're fighting back. Sarah Marler is right here next to me. She wants to give closing remarks before we all find some shade. Hi guys. Thank you so much for coming out today, and thank you for all of your support, whether you're here in person or on Facebook watching this or just 
sitting at home and on Facebook speaking up or encouraging others to speak up. It is such, it takes such courage to come here and to stand up for what's right. And we so appreciate the turnout today. It is just awesome. And I hope that the victims hear us and see our support and know that they have people who are here to fight for them and are here to talk to them. Vaughn has obviously been just doing a phenomenal job and I am so, so, so uh, indebted to her and feel so much gratitude towards her. Um, but certainly, you know, I'm around, Ramona's around, you know, there's lots of us around that are willing to educate and support and speak. I wanna thank the community leaders that are here today for coming out and giving their support. I see there are political representatives here today who have come out to give their support. I wanna thank them as well. And for you guys all being here in this heat, making your signs and showing your support, and standing up for those who, who can't stand up for themselves or, or who can and had the courage to do it, thank you so much.